it in the bunker. I mean, that, that magazine doesn't produce itself. So, I mean, that's a lot of work putting that thing out. Outstanding issue. I You're really very enjoyed kind. It. We had some really good contributors. I love that piece from the, uh, from the Bangladeshi academic about the coverage of the Rohingya. I thought it was fascinating. Yeah, you, yeah. overall, very good stuff in that, that article by Jeanette Jasperson, outstanding. You know, that, that young woman's a pretty good writer, I'll tell you. And she did it like lickety, lickety split, almost as fast as uh, Steve the journalist. Well, and, and, and there's a reason why journalists write things right after an event, which I still do. Because if I waited two weeks, you know, or even a week, I wouldn't remember anything. See, my, my article last year, I recorded everything. See, I'm not a journalist. I had to go back and then re-listen and then write it up. Ah, I'm not a journalist. That's okay. Your article was nice, too. Thank you, Steve. And Matthew, what about you? You fully engaged and occupied or you find yourself bored? Yeah, no, we've got some great events coming up and, and, and this transition to digital has really been an experience, so it's been good. You know, I think, and I, I, I know I speak for many of my academic colleagues, that while we anxiously await a return to face-to-face, -face, I think that uh, that even among those of us who have taught online, that this has made us so much more comfortable with a lot of online technologies and possibilities, you know, that I see myself using Zoom on a, a much more regular basis in class. And you know, well, I've always had guest speakers and the like in, but, um, you know, I, I, I really see Zoom as something that I'm, that I may do every class and may be giving students sometimes the options of joining us by Zoom. Um, I, but I think that it's opened the door to a lot of possibilities. I think that's right. Well, everybody, I think we'll, we'll go ahead and, and sort of give ourselves up here. Um, thank you all for being here. This is our first Lexicon program, so we are very, very excited uh, to have you all here. Thank you for trying this out with us. Uh, and special thanks to Dr. Tom Patterson from Johnson County Community College uh, for being our, uh, our instructor extraordinaire this evening as we, as we tour the wonderful word of, world of Polish. Um, Tom, I will tell you, I tried to look up some Polish earlier to speak to you this evening, uh, and it did not go very well. So I'm going to rely on you to produce the Polish this evening, and the rest of us can learn. Um, uh, this evening, uh, we are going to be recording the event. Um, if you have a, a problem with that, you're welcome to just uh, to turn off your microphone and your, your camera. Um, if you have any questions about this event or the recording, feel free to contact John. Uh, his email address is in the chat box. Uh, if you enjoy this program, please give us feedback. We would love to hear from you. Uh, and also please consider joining the IRC or donating to support future programming like this. Uh, links are available through the chat to join, make a donation, or to download the IRC app, and we'll get those up there for you. And so we're gonna uh, go ahead and begin recording now. So I think Evan, uh, Evan will take care of that. Uh, we're also gonna be broadcasting this on, on Facebook. Um, so welcome again to today's presentation of Lexicon Bite Size Language Intros. Uh, this, event, this event is meant to bring you the basics of a new language, as well as some of its context in culture and history. Uh, so tonight's language is going to be Polish, uh, again, brought to you by Dr. Tom Patterson of Johnson County Community College. Uh, Dr. Patterson has lived all over the world and, and has great experiences that I'm sure he'll share with us this evening. Uh, and we are so glad to have him and JCCC as a member of the IRC. So Dr. Patterson, thank you for that. Um, you are welcome uh, at this time to, to uh, mute yourselves if you don't mind, and, and Dr. Patterson will open it up for interaction as we go. Uh, and if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat box or we'll get to that later on. Uh, thank you, and without further ado, Dr. Patterson, please take it away. Thank you, Matthew, and uh, start off by thanking you for this wonderful idea. Um, I think your audience is gonna grow. What a, what a great way to travel around uh, the world of languages. Um, I'm going to start with a brief introduction of myself. 
uh, in which I'll stay on the screen and then I'm going to bring up, I have a PowerPoint, so you'll be able to look at uh, um, the words and some graphics and other things uh, that what I'm talking about. Um, I've never studied Polish um, in the classroom, as it were. Uh, I learned it uh, getting through life in Poland. Um, I lived there from uh, 1981 to 1987. So this is before the economic, political, social change that happened in 89. And then I went back uh, uh, briefly for a year in 1994. So I saw some of the, some of the changes. Um, I worked when I was there. I, I was teaching uh, English at the Jagiellonian University uh, through a program run by the British Council. Uh, my students were uh, Polish professors and assistant professors. Uh, and, um, and then when I went back in 94, 95, I was working for National Lewis University um, out of Chicago in the US. Uh, my uh, training is, um, I have advanced degrees in linguistics, uh, theoretical linguistics, and then I also have a PhD in English. Um, I'm not Polish in terms of my ethnic background. I consider it sort of my adopted country. Um, my son was born in Poland. He lives in Krakow today. And uh, so I get back uh, to see him fairly regularly and expect, was planning to go back this summer, but we'll see what happens. So uh, with that, I'm gonna go to share my screen and hope it comes up, cross your fingers. Hey, look at that. We are off and running. So pretty much giving you my uh, introduction here. Um, I think uh, it's appropriate to start out with the national anthem. Uh, you don't need to stand up, but uh, let's be respectful. So I'll just play a, a couple of lines to give you a sense of what it sounds like. And then I'm gonna make some comments on that. Okay, so uh, give me, let me, this is a good introduction into uh, Polish culture and Polish psyche. Um, this was written in the 18th century and the Dombrowski that's mentioned in here uh, was a Polish general who later fought with Napoleon. And I'm gonna go through some very brief Polish history to set the stage for this, but. Poland is one of those countries who is unfortunately located in Europe between some very historically voracious neighbors. Uh, most recently, the Soviet Union and Germany, previously Prussia, Austro-Hungary, Russia. And so it, it was routinely carved up. And then you have, as in this national anthem, the call to reunite the nation, which is a big part of uh, the Polish character. So this shows you in the 18th century, um, the, uh, the outline is of Poland 
And you can see that it was divided into Russian, Prussian, and Austria, uh, Austria-Hungary between uh, 1795, 1918. It wasn't until after the First World War that Poland as a sovereign nation uh, reappeared. And then again, in the, uh, the Second World War, you see that line of demarcation where it was divided between Hitler and Stalin. And um, horrible, horrible uh, death that the Holocaust, as you all are aware of, in which millions of Polish Jews and then also millions of Poles themselves were killed in concentration camps. And when it reemerged at the end of the Second World War, we have this shift of the territory. So this gray, right, which historically was part of Poland, was taken away from Poland and given to Lithuania, uh, Ukraine, and then Poland was given these chunks of Germany. So you have these mass movement of populations, millions of people. Our Poles are moved from here over to here, and Germans from here over to here. So, it's coming. We've already had the national anthem. I'm going to go over um, the linguistic family, uh, languages just like uh, Human beings belong to families, and we can trace them back. And you can, you can see relationships among families, and you can see historically antecedents where they come from. Uh, show you where it's spoken. I'm going to talk about the language in terms of the sounds, some of the structure, the grammar, some of the words. And then I'll, I'll go into some cultural achievements in literature, and films. I'll give you some of my personal experiences with Polish as a language learner and uh, leave you with a couple of phrases so you can impress your friends and neighbors. So, Polish is part of the Indo European family of languages. And This historically has been Asian and Asia and Europe with its origins located in, uh, there's some controversy if you go back six to 9,000 years ago, probably in Turkey or perhaps north of the Black Sea. And then they spread out into India, Asia and, uh, and Europe. So we have, here's Polish right in here. Here's our Indo-European three languages, and you can see Poland, Polish is on the uh, Alto-Slavic branch. The largest is Russian, and then uh, we have Polish, and I'll show you there. This is the Indo-European Balto-Slavic. Um, a lot of those languages have disappeared. In the East, you have uh, Latvian and Lithuanian, cousins of Polish. And then the Slavic languages, Polish is on the Lahitic branch of the West Slavic languages. Other Slavic uh, um, also include uh, Czech and Slovak. And then you have Western and then um, Eastern, including uh, Russian. Um, well, the Slavic languages are much closer uh, in terms of lexicon and mutual intelligibility than, let's say, Germanic or Romance, perhaps more like Romance. Um, for example, I can carry on a conversation with somebody um, in Slovakian. Uh, Czech is a little more difficult, but possible. Um, now, Poles may be able to manage with Russian, but I cannot. Okay, um, 
Poland at its largest in the 16th century, encompassed as an empire, um, Ukraine, Belarus, Lithuania, Latvia, and even up into Estonia and parts of Russia. So speakers of Polish today can be found in remnants in all of those areas. So you've got this dark blue area is where it's the primary and in here it's a secondary language. So you've got Ukraine, um, uh, Belarus, uh, Lithuania, Latvia, and Russia. And now we have arrived at the Polish alphabet. Um, you can see it looks somewhat simil similar to English. You can see a lot of letters like, for example, A or A. This one's slightly different. That's a nasalized A. And then you get some of these with the uh, diacritics on them. And I'll talk about these um, uh, combination of consonants that represent sounds that by and large we do not have in English, which is a challenge uh, that I'll talk about a little bit later. Polish vowels. Uh, they have eight vowel sounds, uh, six more oral monothongs, mono meaning a, a pure vowel, a singular vowel, and then two nasal diphthongs. It's called, uh, well, a diphthong because it gets two sounds. So you've got your nasal and the vowel sound. So these pure ones are E as in Mish, E as in Ten, E as in Mish, A as in Ptak or Bird, and then two letters to represent the U sound as in Boom, O as in Kot, and then L for Vange, Snakes, and Au for Vange. So you see the plural there, Vange is Belgia is an irregular. For comparison, uh, if you look at the um, American vowels, you can see we have twice as many vowels. So when a Pole, I've heard this from Poles, when they hear American speaking, the language in a stereotypical way sounds to them kind of like ow, 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 right? All these vowels. Whereas, and here you can see the comparison, um, Polish vowels, and then the American or English vowels with lots of intermediary, which can cause problems for Polish learners of English. Okay, Polish consonants. Uh, for those of you that don't have um, linguistic background, on the top bar here, if you think of going from your lips to the back of your mouth, you're traveling labial, which are sounds made with your lips, like an M or a P, the dental alveolar are sounds made right in the back of your teeth or the ridge right behind that. And then you've got retroflex where the tongue is turning back. Palatal, it's up on the middle of your palate and velar on the back. And then of course, voiced and voiceless. And they trill their R's, which has always caused me problems. So uh, pronunciation problems in Polish for native English speakers. And one of the biggest problems is these alveolars and palatals 
That is, if you think of the sound ch, right? And here it is, the Polish CZ, which is like uh, the sound of ch in chair, right? That's chair. That's uh, your tongue is right behind your, uh, your teeth on that alveolar lip uh, ridge there, chair. You can see when your tongue makes that, it's pushed right up against that ridge. But Pol Polish also has this C with a line on it, which is, uh, sounds, it's a ch sound, but in that case, that sound is the tongue pushed up in the middle of your palate. So it sounds more like so and it's a bit softer sounding. Um, this is not a, what they call a phonemic contrast in English. You can make either of those sounds for chair and everyone will understand you. In Polish, it does make a difference between words. Here you can see the representation for the ch, as in chista for clean, or the voiced gem. The tongue is right up on that ridge. And then, of course, schma, schma, for moth, or voiced, zhvik, for hoist. The tongue is farther back. Okay, moving on in, uh, to um, consonant clusters. I had a friend of mine um, who served in the Marines, Polish, and his, his nickname was Alphabet uh, because of the huge numbers of consonants in his name, which is not characteristic of um, American or English words. Uh, Polish can have word initial, word medial clusters, that is groups of consonants, up to four, and word final, up to five. So as an example, here we have the Polish word bezwlendne, meaning absolute or heartless, bezwlendne. You can give that a try if you want, bezwlendne. And uh, the other one here, uh, which is blade of grass, and I'm not even gonna pronounce that because uh, I will slaughter it. What I will do is allow you to laugh at my attempt at this Polish tongue twister. Um, and this is the famous one that Poles always ask uh, learners of Polish to say. And the meaning of this phrase is, down here in you see, I have trouble with it. Beetle buzzes in the reed, so and I slaughtered that, so if there are any Polish speakers here, uh, please don't laugh. Okay, moving on to Polish grammar. Uh, Polish is a highly inflected language. By that, I mean the, the form of words changes. You have syllables added to it and the changing the form of the word to represent a grammatical uh, form. Now, in English, if you take a noun, for example, take the, line, the noun chair, uh, the, the, the form of that word is inflected for number, right? Chair, chairs, and uh, conceivably for possession. So the genitive, uh, the chair's cushion. And that's it. Whereas in Polish, I'll, I'll go into this, they, they inflect for uh, number, they inflect for cases. They have seven cases for nouns, pronouns, and adjectives. And they have three genders, masculine, 
feminine neuter. That's enough to give you a headache. And you try to keep track of that. And here, here is one example. If we take, and this shows you three uh, genders. Kloop is a masculine gender, typically ends in a, in a vowel, I mean a consonant. Mapa, typically feminine genders end in a, a vowel, A, and neuter ends in a vowel, O. And you can see the, the uh, declensions here for the nominative, accusative, uh, and all the other cases and how it changes in the singular and plural. And they're different depending on um, neuter, feminine, or masculine. And then of course, the adjectives also are inflected and they have to agree for the noun, for number, for uh, gender, and for case. Polish verbs are also uh, highly inflected. Um, they have this notion of perfective and imperfective. So depending on whether an action has been completed or has not been completed, uh, it'll take a, a different uh, uh, conjugation. Uh, genders in Polish, if a man is speaking, there are different endings for verbs than if a woman is speaking. And if a woman is talking about in the plural, so we, then if that plural includes a man, then here's the sexism of the language, then the woman needs to uh, conjugate for masculine. Masculine, of course, stays if you're talking about we meaning a female. Um, number and um, lots of irregularities. Okay, here we go. This gives you uh, conjugations of um, the verb to go and in Polish, they have two different verbs. Um, hojic is if you're going on foot, and jeździć, those are the infinitives, if you are going in a vehicle, either drive, driving or uh, riding. And uh, here you can see the masculine endings in the past. In the, these are the past tense, right? Hojiwen, versus a woman would be hojiwam, right? Hojiwesh. Ojiwash, Ojili, O Ojiwa, and then uh, imperfective, right? In the sense of I was going, Shedwem, Shedwesh, Shed, and then uh, for the perfective, you know, I I went, uh, Poshedwem, uh, Poshedwesh, Poshed. Um, and then of course, plural. Okay, well, I think that probably gives you a pretty good idea that uh, Polish is a difficult language to learn by the State Department's categorizing of languages in which they have four categories. Category one, in which they give 24 weeks, that's Spanish, Italian, Swedish. Category two, 36 weeks. Category three is where Polish resides with Greek and Hebrew and other hard languages. And then you have the very hard ones like Japanese or Korean. Okay, here's your chance to try on a little Polish. Uh, so you can repeat after me. I wanna say good morning. And here's the basic pronunciation. Dzień dobry. Dzień dobry. And you notice, it's another characteristic of Polish, that the accent in Polish is always regularly on the pen ultimate syllable. So the second to last syllable, and it's regular, unlike English. So, dobry wieczór. Good evening. Dobry wieczór. And then good night once again. 
penultimate, second to last syllable, put that bra for the accent, tobranots, tobranots, and then chesh for hello. Poland uh, has a rich tradition of great literature, poets and novelists, short story writers. They have won six Nobel prizes in literature. Um, we're including Isaac Bashiva Singer, who I think probably most of you know better than the others here who wrote in Yiddish, but was a Polish uh, citizen up until when he emigrated uh, before the Second World War. Um, more recently, just in 2018, Olga Tokarczuk uh, won. She's a Polish novelist. And uh, previous, my favorite poet in the world, Wisława Szymborska. And there is uh, Wisława's uh, photograph. She died in 2012. And uh, she lived in Krakow, where I lived. Uh, we never met, but I've been a big admirer of her poetry. And she is, if we were to make a comparison in English, perhaps Emily Dickinson would be the closest. They both wrote um, sparingly what they wrote. What they did write was, was uh, uh, universally excellent and their poems are on the shorter side. Here's a poem that I'm going to read and then I'll let you hear her read it so you can, under, you can understand it better. I've got the English here also. It's a wonderful poem called The Three Oddest Words, Chiswava Naiji Nesha. Kiedy wymawiam słowa przyszłość, pierwsza sylaba odchodzi już to przyszłość. Kiedy wymawiam słowa cisza, niszczę ją. Kiedy wymawiam słowa nic, stwarzam co, co nie mieści się w żadnym niebiecie. Beautiful thought provoking poem. Now, let's hear Wisława read it. I think we'll skip the song afterwards. Here's a, if those of you that are interested in reading something, I have a few recommendations for you. Um, going from the top, I'll just say just a few words. Some of you who are like um, science fiction will be familiar with um, Solaris by Stanislaw Lem, one of the great science fiction writers of the world and uh, translated by my friend uh, uh, Bill Johnston, who has translated uh, a huge amount of uh, Polish, in my mind, the premier translator of the language. He just finished uh, the epic poem on Tadeusz uh, for the first time in English directly from the Polish and this also was the first directly from the Polish. Previous English translations were from the French. And then some history. We have a book uh, with a uh, Warsaw Ghetto uh, Uprising survivor. We have a one of my personal heroes, um, also a recipient of the Presidential Medal of Freedom and also awards from Israel. Jan Karski's Story of a Secret State, My Report to the World. 
Uh, during the Second World War, he was smuggled into the Jewish ghetto and then into Auschwitz and then to England to report on the Holocaust and to ask the West to intervene and stop it. Uh, they, uh, Grain of Truth, that's a sort of a criminal uh, history. Uh, there's Olga Tokarczuk, a uh, recent Nobel Prize winner. Um, and then a good collection of poetry by Szymborska. And then finally, we have James Michener. If you want to get a good sort of historical uh, summary of Polish history, uh, he has done a basic, good basic outline. Polish films. I think uh, you're all familiar with Roman Polanski, uh, who started his film career in Poland with this list of Polish directors. These are all trained after the Second World War by the national government as what you can think of as um, auteur based cinema. So very much focused on the artistry of the film. They're all amazing directors that I encourage you to watch. If you go on, uh, on realgood.com, country Poland, you can get a big list of both Polish films and TV series that you can stream online there on Netflix. And I'm gonna finish up and then I'll turn to any questions you have. Um, as I said before, I lived in Poland from 81 to 87, 95 to 96. So I have, was there before the political economic change and after. I know what it's like to stand in line and chase people that have peanut butter or, no, I'm sorry, not peanut butter. What am I saying? They didn't have peanut butter. Toilet paper, matches, chocolate. I could go on and on was all rationed at that time. Of course, now, you know, that's all in the past. I struggled to learn Polish, but I had to know it when I went to shops because you had to tell them what you wanted and how much of it you wanted. It wasn't like the supermarkets where you can go in and pick it out. You told them, they weighed it out and in grams and they served you. Um, at that time, there were few um, foreigners speaking Polish. And I remember I was in Krakow when the American Council that would have uh, parties for Americans. And there were two other Americans in Krakow at that time besides me. One other uh, professor at the university and a Fulbright professor. So it was three of us. That's it. Uh, today, I don't know, 10,000 at least. Uh, so when I would speak Polish, people would notice. I can remember getting in line to buy uh, my newspaper every day. And a newspaper in Polish is Gazeta. And I would simply have to say, a newspaper, please, Gazeta Poproszę. And I would look at the people in front of me, and the person would give them the newspaper not even look up, take their money, take their money, take their money. And then when I came, their head would pop up, they would look at me, and then would invariably ask me, where are you from? <laughs> I would also accuse of being drunk because of my uh, uh, pronunciation or having a bad cold. Uh, as I said before, my son lives in Krakow, he works there and uh, I visit occasionally. He, of course, uh, uh, is fluent in Polish. And when he hears me speak Polish when we're in company with other Poles, it always brings a smile to his face, perhaps jointly that, that I'm able to speak the language, but also a little bit from amusement at the strange way I speak it. So uh, thank you for your kind attention. Uh, questions? Tom, thanks so much. That was, that was really great. My, um, 
my Polish is not going to be able to come out right now. I'm, I'm afraid it has, I haven't been able to muster it. Uh, but yeah, if, if you guys have questions, just feel free to unmute yourselves and, uh, and fire away. Jessica. Um, so if we can't go to Poland, obviously we can't do that right now, but what's your best, or like what would you say would be the best way to learn Polish? Is there a program that you recommend or just watching films or? Well, you can start with uh, Duolingo. You know that program? I do, yeah, I have it. 10 or 15 minutes. Um, I know that uh, where I work at Johnson County Community College, we do not offer courses in Polish. You might check at um, uh, KU, because um, I know they have a Slavic center. So it's probably more than likely they will offer something. Um, so, Jessica, I'm looking at your last name, Szalawiga, is that Polish? Well, it's kind of confusing, but as you discussed with the borders changing, my grandpa was from Ukraine. Uh -huh. So I always thought it was Ukrainian, but when I would meet Ukrainian people, they'd be like, that's not a Ukrainian name. And I did get the chance to visit Poland in 2014, and there's SZ combinations everywhere, but yeah, people really struggle. With my so how, how, do you, how do you pronounce your name now? Salaviga. Salaviga, yeah. Okay. Yeah, well, I encourage you to learn it. Um, you know, when I first started learning Polish, I tried to learn it um, systematically, and I got nowhere. Absolutely nowhere, because it's so complicated. And then I did something that's kind of a throwback to how languages were taught 50 years ago. I just started memorizing dialogue. So I learned basic phrases, basic, had a basic inventory that got me started, and then I could build on that. So I guess that would be my, uh, don't be intimidated by the grammar or the pronunciation. It's a beautiful language and just start. That's great. Anybody else have a question? It looks like we have a recommendation in the chat box uh, for a possibility for uh, Polish studying as well. So check that out. Oh, where's the chat box? Oh, here it is. I, Brad, well, I, I think we are at the end of our time, but Tom, thank you again for your uh, your your kind presentation tonight. Very, very interesting. Uh, this is the start of our lexicon program, so we hope that you'll send us plenty of feedback, everybody. Uh, give us your thoughts. What can we uh, change? What would you like to see stay the same? Uh, next week, we're going to have a great lesson in Hindi, so we're going to travel over to the subcontinent, uh, and then the following week, we have a lesson in Thai. So we've got a whole list of them on the website. Uh, we encourage you to go online and, and check those future weeks out, uh, and we look forward to hearing from you. Um, and I, uh, Matthew, oh, ahead, Tom. Yeah. I'm, just, uh, I'm just noticing I have to apologize. So evidently you weren't able to hear the, um, the YouTube clips that I played, is that right? Oh, I think so, yeah. My apologies. I don't know, I don't know why that happened. No but, worries, uh, it'll, it'll encourage us all to go you, online and, and look them up. Go to YouTube and, uh, and uh, you'll be able to listen and Absolutely. hear it. Thank we've you all. Other pro we've got some other programs coming up this week as well. We've got a program tomorrow night on uh, complexities for refugees in pandemics. Uh, we've got some other news and views. We've got a, a book club coming up as well. So do go on the IRC website and check that out. And thank you so much, everybody. We hope you have a good night. Thank you.